Hi everyone, my name is Michael Page, and this is the next in a series of videos I'm doing speculating about the design of SpaceX's Starship, both how the components will be arranged within Starship, as well as a concept of operations. I've had great fun developing new animations for things like how Starships might dock in space, and a much more detailed rendition of the deployment and handling of payloads on the surface of Mars. But first, I want to send a massive thank you to everyone who liked, commented, and subscribed as a result of my previous video. It was a wild ride to see something go viral like that, so that's why I had to come back and try to do even better this time. If you'd like to know more about my company, Exodus Space Systems, and what we're doing about the space debris problem, I invite you to stick around to the end of the video where I'll talk more about what we're doing and how you can support us. For most of us space enthusiasts, the answer to this question, why we go to space, is pretty obvious. But sometimes it needs to be said that going to space has had immense positive effects on our society. Whether that's the way technology developed in space gets applied to issues on Earth, whether that's the way that it inspires children to seek out STEM education subjects and excel at them, whether it's the international cooperation we get from projects like building the International Space Station, or the way it's inspired so many people to start up new space companies to try and take advantage of this window of opportunity we've got for humanity to go to space. I think it's completely reasonable that by 2050 we could have an infrastructure that can support thousands of people in space so that anyone with the right skills can go and contribute to humanity's exodus into the solar system. Now, there are a variety of different factors above and beyond simply constructing the rocket itself that we have to take into account when creating a system to settle Mars. And the first of these is propellant generation for your return journey to Earth. We're not sending people to their deaths, so we need, by one estimate, 16.1 gigawatt hours of energy generated on Mars to convert 540 tons of water ice into the necessary propellants to return one starship back to Earth. For the purposes of this video, I'm assuming this task requires human supervision. Next, you have to account for Earth and Mars as they travel around the Sun in their respective orbits. You have a synodic period, a planetary alignment of 780 days, which can be visualized in what's called a pork chop plot. Without going into too much detail, one of the implications of looking at these charts is that if as they plan to, SpaceX uses in-situ resource utilization to generate the propellants for the return flight, they will not be able to return on the same synodic period in which they arrived. They'll have to wait for one or perhaps two synodics to return the astronauts. Those of you doing the math will realize that's a total trip time of about five years and three months, which obviously has huge implications for human health. The two elephants in the room are the radiation problem, and the microgravity or partial gravity problems, which over time periods that long could have drastic effects on human health. And I think that any mission architecture which is serious about Mars settlement has to address these problems head on. Lastly, we need to be aware of the significant cost and logistical challenges that both SpaceX and all the suppliers of this infrastructure will face. Not only do things need to be highly redundant so that the astronauts will be able to safely return home, we also need a highly standardized and modular system so the astronauts can work independently and mix and match various components to get the outcomes they need. All of these factors need to be balanced against each other, so I hope you'll see I've done that, as well as incorporated several of the comments from the previous video into these designs. Okay, so let's have a look at the updated model. First thing you'll notice are the four fins that Starship uses to perform the skydiver maneuver on entry, descent, and landing. There's also a solar array, which is modeled after the solar array on SpaceX's Dragon 2, and this is what I see as the fixed part of a fixed plus deployable solar array, since this part by itself wouldn't be able to support a crew Starship. I've also depicted the heat shield on the ventral or belly surface of Starship, but from here on we're mainly going to talk about the improvements to the speculations I made in the previous video. 
Looking inside, you'll see I'm still sticking to the one-third, two-third arrangement I supposed in the previous video. One-third for pressurized crew, which consists of the nose cone, and two-thirds is the 500 cubic meters in the cylindrical, unpressurized cargo section. At the top, we've got our Japanese pod hotel-inspired quarters for 12 crew, which was the number of crew I came to in the previous video as the optimum number for Starship. And for those commenters who are really tall and worried about the size, now even the shortest of these pods is 2.1 meters long. As before, on each side I've got transparent red sections to indicate utilities necessary for the functioning of the Starship. That's batteries, filtration, even actuators for the fins. Moving on down to the second level, we come to the radiation shelter, which is also where the majority of the water stores would be kept. Water is an excellent radiation attenuator, so it makes sense that this is also where the kitchen would be, or anything else that requires fluid management, like toiletries, bathing, or exercise equipment. Each of the floors and ceilings here have three functions. They need to regulate temperature throughout the craft, baffle sound, and also hold pressure in the event of an emergency. Finally, we move down to the third floor, which is kind of a multi-purpose area. It's where the crew acceleration couches will be during launch and landing, a large bank of storage units, which is for foodstuffs and other utilities, as well as places to put the acceleration couches during cruise phase. And below all that, we've got an airlock with four openings. The opening above leads to the cruise section. Below is for crew access to the cargo during flight. And on each side, we've got two hatches which allow an indefinite number of starships to dock to each other in space. The way this would work is that you can see each of the fins has a target, and on the dorsal surface of the starship there are probes. When these attach together for the two starships, this stabilizes the structure. One of the starships extends an inflatable tube, which protects the astronauts as they transfer between vessels. If you take this to its logical conclusion, there's no limit to the number of starships that can dock at one time. Before I move on, I do want to take a moment to discuss how I'm thinking about the different starship variants, because I realize this is different from what Elon Musk has spoken about in the past. Rather than talking about cargo versus crew variants of starship, I think we should be thinking about zero-g optimized versus planetary surface optimized versions of Starship. The one on the left, the Chomper variant that SpaceX is building first, is simpler. It will be able to generate revenue sooner by taking large payloads to space, and it's also something that will be vital when they're experimenting with the zero-g propellant transfer that will become important later. But once we get to starships on the surface of another planetary body, we need them to be as redundant as possible so that any minor system failures, say that uh, you could troubleshoot if you had the time, if those occur at major mission time points, you need to be able to quickly swap to a different, equally capable starship and continue on the mission. This, along with the logistical imperative to try and have as few variants as possible, is why I think these cargo variants that go to Mars in advance of crew are simply going to be this planetary surface variant without crew. Starship is going to be transporting a lot of cargo, and for my inspiration I've looked at shipping containers, which come in 20 foot and 40 foot versions, as well as the CubeSat specification which comes in any number of multiples of this one new format. I think the same thing is going to happen for Starship Cargo. Here, you can see the framework for a full height container, which comes in several variants. Also, you can have half height variants, which in my mind is the Rover Transporter and the Solar Panel Array. Maybe you need a version which has a pressurized section but will otherwise serve as a platform for experiments or in-situ resource utilization equipment that you need to access from the outside. Or alternatively, you have a fully enclosed habitat section shown here with transparent walls. I'll just enlarge this to point out a few things that will become important later. Firstly, you see the four black extendable legs, the rectangular cutouts, which are meant to indicate whatever interface the Starship crane uses to manipulate the modules, and the circular extendable bolts, 
which are how the modules are supported during launch and landing, and also for interfacing with Starship systems. Some of you will also have noticed that I've fixed a mistake that I made in the previous video where I used an older docking system. Here I've depicted the International Docking System Standard, or NASA Docking Standard, which is a three-petal system symmetrical around one axis, and it has connections for fluids and electrical, so it has everything we need. How might that work in practice? Well, here's a visual of the Starship Cargo Bay. Uh, with transparent walls, two full height and two half height modules stacked on top of one another. They use these docking ports to link to each other vertically and allow access by the crew whilst in flight, and they also have these bolts which extend out to mate with the appropriate interfaces on the ventral and dorsal internal surfaces of the Starship cargo hold. Okay, so we've arrived at Mars, woohoo, and we land on our four stubby landing legs. But of course, we don't want to overbalance the craft when we're unloading our cargo, so each of the fins I've equipped with the Falcon 9 style extendable leg. Cargo bay door opens there, and the first thing to come out will be this rover transporter. For the sake of argument, I've given it eight extendable wheels, which will allow it to increase its ground clearance, as well as a conveyor belt system, which will enable it to handle the payloads which are placed on top of it. Now this two-part crane design is still quite notional, but I arrived at this design because of the spatial constraints inside the payload bay, as well as the need to be able to manipulate payloads both in zero-g and on a planetary surface. The next thing we're moving is another half-height module, which in this case is a solar panel array. For this scenario, the docking port is not used to transfer crew, but simply to hold the module securely on top of the transporter so we can move it to a more appropriate location. There may well be a much more mass efficient way to attach that particular solar module to that particular rover, but remember the aim here is to get the logistical savings that you receive by having a common module specification, same as for CubeSats or shipping containers. No matter whether you're stacking these things together to make a space station or putting them together on the ground, you want to have the docking ports in the same place every time, the same interface with Starship, and landing legs that can work together with the conveyor belts on the transporter to allow them to be deposited in a robust and reliable way every time. Next, let's go back to our solar array module, which is intended to be able to be deployed both on a surface and in space. I'm assuming the transporter has a robotic arm assembly that would allow it to pull these sheets out to their full length. As we zoom out and we see this solar field in its full glory, I remind you of that 16.1 gigawatt hour figure I told you earlier. Well, this is the size of the field required to generate that energy over one synodic period, enough to make propellant to return one starship to Earth. Many assumptions built into that, of course, but the key one being the packing density, that is, the area of the solar panel array versus what volume it stows down into. The packing density is the same as for the ISS solar arrays, but this assumes a more efficient 20% solar energy conversion ratio. If this is all reasonable, then that implies that those eight groups of six solar array modules have been transported in advance of the crew by eight cargo-only starships and laid out ready to start in-situ resource utilization as soon as possible. The other thing I think will have to have commenced before crew get there is the construction of a trench, which will serve two purposes. One, this is where those 540 metric tons of water ice per synodic period will have to come from. And two, a moderately deep trench, six meters in this case, will allow sets of stacked habitation modules to be placed in a position where they can be covered with regolith. So that for the majority of an astronaut's stay on Mars, they'll only be exposed to radiation levels somewhat above an airline crew, as opposed to being on the surface where radiation levels approach that of the famous claw that was used to disassemble the Chernobyl reactor. Speaking of nuclear power, I don't want to give the impression that I'm against 
uh, nuclear power for Mars, since there are some really promising projects that would become critical if Mars ever had another global dust storm, such as what ended the Mars Opportunity rover. My point with this section is to show how much of a premium will be placed on energy, so it makes sense to dual purpose things like building this trench, which will harvest the water ice and provide an opportunity to shield the modules from radiation. Let's recap where we are at the moment. We've got a crew at a site which is capable of producing enough propellant to return one starship per synodic period. To do this, we've committed up to 12 starships, and we've got a crew of 12. But what happens if we don't manage to produce enough propellant in one synodic period to return that crew to Earth? Well, it's important that your architecture is robust enough, you have enough supplies with you to allow you the contingency of staying in extra synodic period. In fact, given that you've already got up to 12 starships with storage on board, it might actually be better to plan for that first crew to be there for two synodics, and then as we add more sites, reduce the minimum necessary time spent. And I think there are a number of good reasons why that first campaign should aim to create four sites all within driving distance of each other. The first of these is that you could arrange to do one lot of propellant transfer in low Mars orbit before returning to Earth. And the reason you would do this is that with that extra propellant, with the way the orbital mechanics works out, you could leave later in the window to return to Earth, meaning that at least some crew would be able to arrive on Mars and leave during the same synodic window. Alternatively, if you did the propellant transfer at the normal time, you might be able to reduce your transit time back to Earth. The other thing that extra propellant allows you is the contingency of a second launch if you have an engine failure on your first one. Those starships have been sitting on Mars for a long time at this point, and you don't get to have a static fire before launch, so in this scenario you would do an emergency landing downrange, return back to base, and try again. What I see as the best reason to produce extra propellant is that if you can send starships between Earth and Mars in pairs, that means they can stay docked in this tail-to-tail -tail configuration and spin to produce artificial gravity. Now before I go into the many reasons why you would want to do this, I will just note that I'm showing the solar panels in their zero-g deployed configuration, where they both shade the ship from the sun and also are oriented so they hang away from the center of spin. What I want to do over the next few minutes while I talk about reasoning is depict at true speed the various spin rates you need to achieve various gravity levels. The differences are quite subtle, so see if you can spot them. One of the big problems with spin gravity over the years has always been the difficulty of implementation, so the aim here is to make it as easy as possible for SpaceX to implement. Although nose-to-nose -nose using a tether would seem more intuitive, the fact is that SpaceX is already implementing a way to dock ships tail-to-tail, -tail, and even their current landing leg designs are suggestive of a secure latching mechanism. This has always been in the back of my mind as I've been designing these systems, from putting the crew quarters in the nose of the ship where the gravity level is highest, even having the, the cargo modules able to be flipped 180 degrees and still interface with the ship. And having gravity isn't just a biological benefit either. If you have a convection in the air, it means thermal management is easier, as well as carbon dioxide filtration. But in the end, these are small things compared to the ability to acclimatize astronauts back to full Earth gravity before they arrive. If you do this in three phases I've shown here, starting with 50% of G, then 64% of G, then 80% of G, each one of those steps is an even incremental step back up to 1G, which means these astronauts' bodies, some of which will have been away for over five years, will have the best chance of surviving back at 1G. So, to try to summarize all of that, here's my pictorial representation of what I hope the Mars foothold campaign might look like. Across the top, you've got a timeline with the roughly two-year synodic periods marked out, and like clockwork, you're going to have a campaign of starships landing on Mars, setting up these four different sites, and for the first decade, you see you've got roughly 24 people on Mars at any one time, 
and a pair of starships, returning those crews at each opportunity. After this, the timeline starts to get really exciting because you have enough power generation facility and radiation protected habitat space that you have the beginnings of a real settlement. You can start to ramp the numbers up, have tourism, or even send those starships on to further destinations in the solar system. If you're like me, you find all of this incredibly exciting. You know it may not look like that, or it may not occur in a certain time frame, but the fact that it's all generally within the realms of possibility, this is amazing stuff. When we were thinking about getting into the space industry ourselves, we realized we had to tackle something a bit closer to home, and space debris fit that bill. We all use the internet, weather forecasts, mapping and GPS, and all of that is reliant on space-based technology. So, if we can provide a service that actually reduces the risk to the people who provide those services, that's good business. What we've done at Exodus is create a new, more scalable and more versatile solution which can address the tens of thousands of small objects hurtling around the Earth at 25 times the speed of a bullet. We're distinct from other what we call rendezvous and capture methods in that we perform a flyby maneuver placing a series of proprietary low density particles into the path of the targeted debris, harmlessly deorbiting it into the atmosphere where it burns up. So far we've been really fortunate to receive a couple of key endorsements, one from Deorbit, the Italian space company, and the second from Surrey Satellite Technology in the UK. We're also incredibly fortunate to have the support of the team at the Centre for Entrepreneurial Research and Innovation, where we're based in Western Australia. But like all startup companies, we need to pay our bills. So with this video, we're launching a Patreon crowdfunding drive. For as little as the cost of a coffee per month, you can support us while we do our R&D on this kinetic solution for space debris. And also, you'll get to see our vision of how we think the broader settlement of the solar system will work. Now, hopefully it's obvious that I really enjoy making videos like these, but this did take me a month to make, so one of the first inputs we'll be looking for from our patrons is whether you want to see videos like these monthly, or maybe shorter videos more frequently. Our initial goal is $1,500 a month, and I'll put that Patreon link in the description so that you can head right on over after this. That's the end of the video, so if you made it this far, thank you for watching, and have a great day.